Well, good morning and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be fighting the Battle of Ulsan, which is one of the first major naval engagements of the Russo-Japanese War. Um, if you're not familiar with the Russo-Japanese War, it might seem like an odd subject, uh, but actually it's quite fascinating. It's really the first major engagement of uh, post-ironclad, pre-dreadnought ships um, that we see in the world. Um, in, re in real life, it was a complete uh, floor wipe by the Japanese Navy with the Russians, um, and we're going to play it out on the tabletop with a few modifications and see what happens. The rules we would be using is Grand Fleets, and I'd love to show you them, uh, but they're actually an electronic copy on my laptop. So this is the quick reference sheet, and this is everything. There, there are no further references um, to the rulebook other than you can see here, which is absolutely fantastic. Grand Fleets itself is a rule set which covers the age of battleships, so that's roughly 1890 through to about 1950. The focus clearly is on cruisers, battleships, dreadnoughts and so on, uh, rather than carriers and submarines, although aircraft, submarines, torpedoes, anti-aircraft weapons do feature in the slightly more advanced rules, which come free with the book. And here we're going to mostly stick to relatively simple ship-to-ship -ship combat with some torpedoes. If you've played Battletech, you'll be familiar with the use of data cards or record sheets for your mechs. And in this game, we have a similar concept. What you can see here is a set of reference data cards for each of our ships. We have the Japanese Navy on the left, the Russian on the right. Um, I'm going to quickly run through the, the sheets here, because I'm not going to show this in great detail as I'm playing. If we look at the Azuma, for example, uh, we can see the armor value here, that's front and side armor. Uh, then we can see the hull. As we take damage, as we take hits, we start marking these off. And when we hit a border, we take critical damage, uh, and there's uh, bad things happen. Down here, we have all of our weapons. Now, you can fly every weapon every turn on the assumption that you're within range, and you're in the correct arc, and you have enough attack dice. And this is probably the key feature of, of this game, is that you start, when you want to do an attack, you start at the leftmost column, so in this case, four, and then things happen which degrade your ability to fire. So you might, for example, um, be in the forward or aft arc, which is a minus two, so you go four three, two. Uh, then if you're a long range, you go down again, but in this case, you go down and it's still two. Um, then maybe if your armor penetration is worse than the armor of the ship you're fighting, you might go down again. And so as I'm playing the game, I will be saying things like uh, minus one for range, minus one for armor. And that doesn't mean minus one dice or minus one to hit. It means minus one on this track. And that eventually tells us how many dice we're going to roll. So somewhere off the coast of Korea, we have the Imperial Japanese Navy Second Fleet, the first and second divisions. This is the flagship Izumo, and it's been sent out by the um, Navy Command in Japan to stop the Russian Pacific Squadron over here, which has been attacking frigates and generally making a nuisance of itself. As I said earlier, in, in real life, this was a complete floor wipe. The Japanese have got more mobile ships with bigger guns that do more damage. Uh, the Russian ships are incredibly old. Uh, the Rurik at the back here actually still has sails in an age where they're probably 20 years out of date already. In order to make this a more balanced game, rather than a historical scenario, we are going to treat the Japanese Navy as being green. And now that means that they always have a, a one penalty for their shooting. So they always get one less on that track of guns that we saw earlier. Um, that is because they are roughly about 25% more points than the, than the Russians, and um, that will even out the points, make it a bit more competitive, a bit more exciting game. Right, the first thing we do, I've put these on the table to show you them, but the first thing we do in Grand Fleets is we work out the, uh, the initial command ratings of our uh, divisions. So we roll 2d6 for each, and we determine how effective a commander they are, which determines their initiative, which is a modifier for when, which order we move and shoot with. So with a four, I think that's pretty bad actually, um, with a uh, for the Naniwa, with a 7, that's an average, and with the Russians, that's a 10. So the Russians are going to get a good command rating. <coughs> right, so with, that, with those dice rolled, we are going to get a, a poor commander here in the 2nd Fleet 1st uh, Division, going to get an average commander over there, and we're going to get a good commander over there. So that's a minus 1 to all the initiative rolls of the 1st, a plus 1 to the Russians, and nothing for the 2nd over there. Right, uh, now we roll for initiative, so it's d6 plus your command quality, so d6 minus 1 here, that's 1, d6 over here, that's 3, and d6 plus 1 over here, 7. So what that means is we're gonna, it's going to force the Japanese to deploy effectively first, and we do that by moving their, the movement of the flagship, because in, in, in the initial engagement the flagship has to be in front and closest to the enemy. They can move a total of uh, 4,000 yards per turn which is eight inches. So if I say something thousand, um, it's double that in inches. So they are going to come onto the table like so. They don't have to be base to base, um, but the, like I said, the flagship does have to be at the front. 
I am going to actually space them out a little so that they have a chance of engaging sooner. They have longer range, better guns, better to get them in as soon as they can. These ships are exactly the same. I think I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I'm going to move four. Because four from the edge, sorry. Oh, eight from the edge, there we go. Because the, the risk is, this is uh, these are protected cruisers, which are very much out of date. They're about 15 years old by the time of the engagement. The, the main thrust of the Japanese power is in this division over here. Um, and this is really uh, a bit of uh, the desire for the Japanese to split the fire of the Russian Pacific Squadron. Uh, and we'll do the same for the Russians. So they have the same movement, which is eight, and they are going to come along in line. Uh, no one is going to be within range, although just for the sake of argument, I'll check it. The longest range we have are the Japanese, who have a range of 14,000 yards, and there's nothing there. Right, now we roll again for initiative for the next movement phase. So the Japanese 1st Division gets a 2, the Japanese 2nd Division gets a 6, and the Russian Pacific Squadron gets a 5. So that then forces the 1st Division to move again. So they are going to move 8, and we're now going to Spread them out a little, I think. <clears throat> line of sight is done from bridge to target ship. And if that line crosses another model, not a base, then line of sight is blocked. Now the Russians have to move. again. So the longest gun range of the Russians is 24. So the Russians are now, the Rossiya is now in range for its four guns, its eight-inch guns at the front. Uh, and in contrast, so are all of the Japanese ships. Yes. Right. So the second Division and has the ability to fire first, we had the highest initiative. Their range is only 16 inches though, so they are just out of range with their guns. That means now it's the turn of the Russians to fire. The flagship has the longest range, and the Grummerboy, which is behind, does. I think the Grummerboy is going to fire at the second division, so let's do the Rossiya first. The Russia has um, its two attack dice, and we go down by one for the range. So it's just one on hitting on fives, and we're going to be shooting at the Izuma. And we'll also fire at the the Grommel boy. Actually, no, we'll, we'll fire with the. If we're out of range for the smaller guns, so we'll try with the Grommel boy on the. Naniwa, so that's these two, needing that's, uh, ten and a half thousand yards, um, which means actually only their uh, eight-inch guns will be firing. They are going to take one modifier for the range, and they are, but otherwise they're they're okay. It's one dice, even fives. Nothing. So, not very effective shooting for the uh, the Russians in this turn. Uh, now, the Japanese 1st Division has the opportunity to fire back. The Izumo, Iwate and Tokiwa. Actually, all of these ships in the squadron have a long range of between uh, 14 and 28 inches, um, 7,000 to 14,000 yards, uh, and they're all within that. So, they're all going to be rolling effectively the same dice. So they take minus one because they're green, minus one because they are at long range, and then minus two because they are firing into the, from through their forward arcs. So they take uh, four levels of degradation, which is two dice per ship. They're all gonna fire at the Rossiya. The Rossiya has a front armor of one, and the, all these guns have an armor piercing of two. So they're gonna get plus one, uh, but that doesn't bump them up to another dice, unfortunately. So let's roll for the Izumo. Nothing, the Wate, nothing, and the Tokiwa, nothing. So we've had the firing of the main guns there. The lesser guns aren't getting range, 
So that's the end of that turn's shooting. That was, that was our command. Haven't got any critical damage to repair everything like that. So now we'll roll initiative again. So the first division gets a three, the second division gets a six, and the squadron gets a five. So it's a very similar story here. The danger we have with these ships is that they are they're not going to be able to resist broadsides from the two Russian armoured cruisers. Unfortunately, a bit of a continuity skip there, because I moved them in the wrong order, so now I'm going to move them in the correct order of ascending initiative. So the lowest initiative ships have to move first. In this case, it's back being the first division here of the Japanese. They're going to move forward their full distance. Their hope is going to be to form a line, whichever way it needs to, to catch the Russians on the next turn. They're going to have to hold on for a little longer. Now the Russians are going to have to move. They are going to turn and move four inches. And the Japanese second division, these little uh, frigates, they are going to they're, they're going to receive broadsides from the most powerful ships in the Russian fleet. So I think that it's in their best interest to try and turn and also provide their, their flanks rather than their weakened forward armour. So, so they're going to turn. Right, now they do now get to shoot first. They need to check their arcs roughly. And I think the Rossia is in the side arc of both of those ships. Um, let's see what the range is. So it's 17 inches, 17 inches, and uh, 18 inches. Gosh, they actually might be out of range. Yeah, that was a that was a terrible miscalculation by the second division there. They are out of range with their guns. They are not going to be able to fire at all. So now the Russians are going to take full advantage of that uh, goof there, and they are going to fire. So let's have the Rossia first. The distance, as we said, is just 17 inches, um, which is um, in the long range band. So we degrade one for long range, and um, we have one better armor piercing, so we get one back for the fact that we have armor piercing. Uh, and that's all. So the Rossia will fire its eight inch guns, needing fives. It's two hits on the Naniwa. Then it will fire its six inch guns, and same thing, we are in the long range band, which would reduce us, but then we have better armor piercing, which brings us back up again. So we roll significantly more dice. We now roll eight dice for the six inch guns on the Rossi Indian fives. And we get one, two, three. Now that's terrible news for the Naniwa, uh, because now we have to roll um, some damage checks. And we actually crossed two of the boundaries where you have to roll for damage checks, so we'll have to do this twice. So it's really not looking good. So we roll uh, for how much our engines are affected by this fire, nothing. And then for each weapon, so then anyone's only got uh, three, or two, two sets of weapons, it's got some six inch guns, so that's no effect. And it's got the light guns, uh, which is two, we, we now knock off two of the, um, I'll show you here. So here's the Naniwa, we've been knocking down the armour, um, we haven't had anything else happen, we now need to knock off these two, the first left hand squares of the light guns, which means we can never fire from more than this position, and as we take more damage we'll be crossing more and more of them off. And then we roll to see if we get any critical hits, and with two we roll on the critical hit table with 2d6, and a double one is a magazine hit, which means no matter what happens the ship completely explodes and is immediately lost. So that's uh, terrible news for the Japanese Navy. Now the Rossio is going to fire its uh, light guns. Uh, they are just in range and they only hit on sixes, so they take, um, they have no armor piercing, so they take one degradation for the armor and then another one for the extreme rent for the long range, which means they hit four dice hitting on sixes against the Takachiho. Right, the Grimo boy is going to fire next at the Takachiho, and it's going to be exactly the same in terms of the, the, the numbers and the dice. So that means we roll two dice, the fives for the, the eight inch guns, and that's a hit. And then we roll six dice. 
No, we roll eight dice, meaning fives for the six inch guns. One, two, three, that one was, wasn't. So that's three hits on the Takachiho, and that also requires us to check the damage on the Takachiho. So let's do that. Engines, one, the six inch guns, two, and the light guns, two. Then we roll for critical hits, and with a five, that's no effect, no, no problems for critical hits. Okay, that's uh, really not looking good. The Rurik. Might be able to fire. Actually, no, we'll, we'll fire with the, the light guns on the Grimoire Boy first. Um, it has got a ton of light guns, cracking. Um, so we'll be shooting with a degradation for long range and then another degradation for the armor, which um, it can't penetrate properly. So we'll need sixes on the one six. Okay, the Rurik now, which is the oldest ship in the Pacific Squadron and actually historically was the one that was focused on by the Japanese fleet initially. Um, will now attempt to fire at the same target at the Takajiho. Um, it's likely to be fairly ineffective, but let's see what happens. So the distance from the Rurik to the Takajiho is 10,000 yards, and we're in the forward arc now, so we take a massive um, reduction in firepower firing out the forward arc rather than the side arcs. So our 8-inch guns, we degrade twice because of the um, because of the forward arc, and then we degrade again because of long range, but then we get back because the armor piercing. So it's just one dice and even fives. It does. Right. Now we'll have to roll on damage again because the tiny little protected cruisers have only got two capacity per um, hull area. So we roll for uh, speed, we get one. Weapons, we get two on the six inch guns, and then, oops, sorry, and then one on the light guns. Oh, I did forget to roll for the torpedoes on the, the last time, so I'll do that now for the, the uh, well, no, this is the first set damage for the ship, right? So that's the first port torpedo lost, second port torpedo is okay, first starboard torpedo is lost, right? So we've lost one of each torpedo as well. And then we roll on the critical damage chart with a six, we have no critical damage. So the Takachiho is now really suffering. But that was only our, our, our largest guns on the Rurik. We have a lot more six inch guns. So we take minus four because of the four and a half arc, and then we would have again for long range, and then back up again for the armor piercing. So we are on three dice, needed fives. Like this. Smoke back over here just to show what's going on. And then we'll fire the light guns, which again will only get one dice and they'll need sixes. That's all the shooting complete for the Russians. Now let's look at the beleaguered Japanese first division over here. It is going to do pretty much what it did last time. That is, the large battleships or large armored cruisers are going to be firing at the Rossiya, which is the Russian flagship. And all of them except the Tokiwa are in medium range. So let's do that. So the Izumo will get a minus one for the range, minus one for the crew quality. So it's two dice. Uh, and the armor at the front arc of the Rossiya is one and is armor piercing two. So we go back up one. So we have three dice. The Izumo will get three dice. Iwate will get three dice. Tokiwa will get two. So needing fives. Two bits on the Rossiya. Six inch guns. So we take a minus four because of the, it's in the forward arc. And then we have minus one again because of the crew quality, one again because of the range. That's one dice, and fives. And now we will do the Iwate. So the Iwate will get three dice, needing fives. That's one. And then one dice, needing fives for six inch guns, and misses. And the Tokiwa will get three dice, needing fives for its big guns. Wow, three hits. One, two, three. And it's small guns. But that was enough to push the Rossiya over to a damaged state. So let's roll for the Rossiya's uh, engines. It takes one hit on the engine. Let's go with the uh, eight inch guns. It takes two hits on the eight inch guns. The six inch guns, one. The light guns, two. And then let's check the torpedoes. The four torpedo is lost. The port torpedo is fine. The other port torpedo is fine. Starboard and starboard, okay, great. We just lost the four torpedo. So, criticals, 
the two we roll once on the critical hit table and with a four that is rudder so that means we have to work out if it's a rudder jam to port or starboard with one i think that's port so this means the crosshair uh, now will have to move either straight or to the port to the left hand side which is actually okay in, in terms of this tactical engagement because that's what it's going to want to do to get a broadside into this little division over here. Right. Those are the, well, we put, put some stuff down here, but we know that's all of the guns here. The uh, Azuma, which is behind the other ships in the first division, um, it can't draw a line of sight to the Russian ships yet. So it's not going to do Okay, let's roll initiative. So for the Russians, they get a two. For the first division, they get a five. And for the second division, they get a five. So um, I'll roll between these two. So on a one to three, the first division goes first. Right. So the actually we now have a reverse where the the first division, which had to move first and fire last last time, is now doing that, moving last and firing first. And the Russians now are forced to show their plans. Right. So this ship by itself is incredibly um, badly, badly damaged and it's unlikely to perform anything it needs to do as part of the engagement. So I'm actually going to take this off the board voluntarily um, over the course of the next turn or two, which means I will lose 50% victory points for it, but I've already lost 50% because it's already crippled. So it can move, it can move, rotate and then move up. I think that would be nice. That's enough to take an engine So there is a hope now that it will be able to come off the table. Actually. It's going to try and get off the table. Okay, now the Japanese first division will move. Now hopefully they can, they're going to, none of them take an engine damage. So they're all going to move at full speed, which is 4,000. But they're going to now rotate, rotate, and move four inches. And that should. So we, we've got a little problem here where if you move less than a thousand yards in a turn, you're considered slow, which gives other ships a bonus to hit you. Now, these two ships um, will need to move in different speeds to try and um, present their broadside properly to the Russian fleet. So I'm going to move this here. I'm actually going to move the Azuma like so. So the Azuma still is not going to be able to draw a line on the Russian fleet, um, but next turn it will be able to accelerate faster than the rest of this line, coming to the front and then get a good arc from there. Right, Japanese fleet firing. So I think it probably makes sense to focus down on the uh, Rossiya with a range of four and a half thousand. They are in medium range for the eight inch guns, they're firing a broadside. The only modifier they're going to have is minus one for their crew, but then plus one, I think, no? Yeah, no, minus one for their crew and then minus one for the armor, because uh, the Russian armor on the side is significantly stronger than the front. That's two, the Iwate with the eight inch guns as well. That's two damage. And the Tokiwa does another damage. That's enough to push the Rossiya into a crippled state. So let's roll for the engines. That's two on the engines, yeah. Let's roll for the eight inch guns. That's two, six inch guns is one, I think, yeah. And the light zones is one. Now let's look at the torpedoes. I don't think we really need to worry too much about the port torpedoes because we're never gonna be in a, an arc to fire them. So let's roll for the starboard ones. Okay, and lost, so we only have one starboard torpedo. We'll then fire with the six inch guns. So we're going to be firing at long range. So we lose one for that, and we lose one for the green quality of the crew. And then we lose two for the 
Delta in the armor piercing. So there's two dice. Each of the ships, two dice, and even fives. I'll draw them all. So we get two more hits on the Rossia. Now we'll fire the light guns. So we will be in long range again. And we'll get minus three for the armor, minus four for long range, minus five for armor piercing. Two more. And that is enough to sink the Rossia completely, regardless of what damage it might have taken. And the Japanese now are halfway to victory. That's all they needed to do is sink two of the three ships, and they've they've won quite handily. Unfortunately, the Grimoboy and the Rurik are both completely undamaged. What we have to do now, since we lost the flagship of the Pacific Squadron is we need to re-roll our commander rating. So they were quite lucky before, they had a good commander, and now they have <laughs> they have a great commander rating. Just a good commander. If they'd rolled an 11 or 12, they would have had plus two to their initiative rolls every single time. So let's roll initiative. So we'll roll for the Russians. So they get a two. We'll roll for the uh, over here, the second division, they get a two. And the Japanese over here, they get a four. So we'll have to roll again um, between these, red dice and Japanese. So the Japanese will be going second thing first. The first one it's going to do is take itself off the board, and remove itself from play as a potential target. That's all it's going to do. Now the, well, it would have moved last, but it would have fired first. It doesn't, doesn't matter which one we do that particular bit. So now the Russians have to move. Now they are going to, they really have to focus fire down on, on these ships. They've taken out the second squadron, quite, the second division quite handily, but these are all completely undamaged. So I think what we're going to have to do is, is move and yeah, we're going to have to come around like so probably and try and present what we hope will be a um, broadside to the Japanese fleet before they can they can completely decimate us. So now we don't need to do any more turning. I'm going to bring every ship forward three inches to give it the ability to, to not take any hits because it's because they're moving slowly. Right, let's get into the shooting. So Japanese have a higher initiative, they shoot first. And it's not gonna look all that great, I don't think, for the Grimoire Boy. They are all within five thousand, five and a half thousand apart from maybe the Tokiwa. Right, Tokiwa's in six and a half, and the rest are in five and a half. So the Izuma, Izumo, and the Iwate are all gonna fire at the Gromoboy, uh, which puts them all in medium range. Let's do the Izumo first. So the Izumo is going to fire its um, main guns. It will take a degradation because of the crew. It will then take a further degradation because of the armor. Oh no, actually, no, the armor on, on the Gromoboy isn't as good as the Rossia, so that's just the same. So it's gonna roll three dice, even fives. So a hit first hit roller, and then it will fire six inch guns, of which it's got quite a lot. It will take, it's at medium range, no it's at long range, sorry, so it will take a degradation for that, and again for the crew quality, it's three dice, needing five, and that's two. And we'll do the same with the Azuma, because that's, it's gonna, these are gonna do a similar thing, so three dice, needing fives for the big guns, one hit, three dice, needing fives for the six inch guns, one hit. We roll critical damage on the Grimoire Boy. That's two, two engine hits. That's one big gun hit, two small gun hits. And the light guns, um, they get one hit as well. The port torpedoes, one of them's lost. And the starboard torpedoes, one of them's lost. Right. I have lost track of who was firing which then. I think that was the Izumo firing its six inch guns. I'm sure the comments will tell me otherwise. Um, now I have the Iwate firing, same thing, three dice and even five. One hit and the uh, Azuma firing. No, okay. Now all of their light guns are in long range. They have AP zero, so they're gonna take a penalty of two for the armor and uh, one, an extra one for the crew quality, and an extra one for the range. So they're going to be on two dice, and fives. So Azuma, one hit. Izumo, none. Iwate. Two more hits total. 
Now, we're in range for our torpedoes, so we're actually going to give that a shot. We're going to have the Izumo fire off its torpedoes, so it needs... At least we can mark them off first, it's going to fire both of its port torpedoes at the Grimoire boy. And so it's two sets needing hitting on 10s or 12s. So neither of them hit. The Izumo will do the same thing. So right, we'll fire both torpedoes needing 10s or 12s. And the Azuma will hold on to its. And now we're going to fire with the Tokiwa, which is this ship in the rear. Um, and because it's a bit further away, um, I'm just going to roll those dice separately. It is. Six and a half thousand yards. Actually, no, it, do, it does actually end up in the same range bands. So it's going to roll three dice for big guns, one hit, and then three dice for the small guns. The Grimoire Boy will have to now roll. Let's roll. I did roll critical damage last time, actually, on the Grimoire Boy, so let's do that. Uh, six is none. So let's roll critical damage first. Uh, it takes critical damage, and a six is a fire. We will now roll for the engines. It takes one. And the heavy guns, one. And the light and medium guns, two. And the light guns, one. So, one, two, one. So the Grimoire Boy now is in, in dire straits, especially with a fire raging. The Rural Rick is undamaged, but if the Grimoire Boy is found to be uh, Floundering, taking damage and so on, then we're, we're really in trouble. But I think that the fact that the Grimoire Boy only needs to take four more points of damage, and in order for the Russians to be able to beat the Japanese back, they will need to do another 60 points of damage on four undamaged ships. I think it's fair to say that much like the historical scenario, the Japanese have pretty much decimated the Russian Pacific Squadron, uh, and the Grimoire Boy and Rurik may be able to disengage and limp back to Port Arthur or Vladivostok. Um, but they are probably going to form no major part of the upcoming Battle of Tsushima. So that is the game, basically. It's very simple. There's, there's some housekeeping, but not much in the grand scheme of things, and way less than something like Battletech. Um, I'm really pleased with, with generally how it plays out. Certainly there's the, this ongoing degradation of the ships, which I, I think is amazing. It, it really shows you the length of these engagements and the size of the ships and the resilience that's built into them. I think it would be a more tactically interesting game if there were two squadrons on each side. Because right now, especially with these, the, the Russian Pacific Squadron and the, the Japanese Second Fleet First Squadron, they basically aim at each other, turn to present the broadside, and that's it, really. The tiny Second Division with the little ships, the Naniwa and the Takachiho, although they are very cute, they, they can't take damage at all, so they can't really act as a, a major influence on the battle, particularly. I think if you had two squadrons or two divisions of ships, uh, or, or three to four ships, that were in this kind of statistics, you know, they're, they're armoured cruisers, they're pre-dreadnoughts or something, they, then you would have to split your fire, you could fire broadsides on both sides, you would have uh, further degradation of, of all of your ships would start having things going wrong with them, rather than in this case, as we've seen, we had the ability to present a broadside from four of our best ships against one enemy ship, and that was all she wrote, really. So, hope you enjoyed it. Stick around and I'll do some more.